Okay. <clears throat> so, the first sign of Jonah, the most crucial miracle that Jesus performed, per, uh, basically proving his deity, proving that he was 100% God, was the resurrection of Lazarus for a couple reasons that I'm going to get into within this text that I will dissect a little bit later. This is incredible. I didn't know anything about this. Um, I just learned this. So I'm going to read it to you. It's gangster. The first sign of Jonah was the resurrection of Lazarus. And the Sanhedrin responded to this sign by meeting and officially rejecting it and decreeing a sentence of death against Yeshua in absentia, meaning within their close quarters, they decided as a group, we got to put this dude Jesus to death. So in absentia, in, in private in, in quarters, they decided like, like the U.S. government would, would decide on something. Bam, all in favor of putting Jesus to death, say I, and everyone, I. Here we go. <clears throat> this decision filtered down to the masses. So let me say this again. The Sanhedrin responded to this sign, the resurrection of Lazarus, by meeting and officially rejecting it and decreeing a sentence of death against Jesus, this decision filtered down to the masses. In the Bible, it says, now the chief priests and the Pharisees had given commandment that if any man knew where he was, he should show it that they might take him. John 11, 57. While this verse reconfirms the official rejection of the first sign of Jonah, the uniqueness of the miracle still attracted the multitudes. I need you to understand something. The, the multitudes of people witnessed Lazarus be resurrected not resuscitated resurrected from the dead the multitude saw this so you can't deny what people saw in that moment what they felt for themselves in that moment you can't just delete that from history right so check this out the common people therefore of the jews learned that he was there and they came not for yeshua's sake only but that they might see eleazar also whom he had raised from the dead, John 12, verse 9. So what that just said is, folks were not only wanting to come to see the spectacle of Jesus, who they've heard performs miracles, cures people, feeds people, just performs amazing feats. He's God. They wanted to see Lazarus. They're like, dude, this fool was dead for four days. He, he, he's the only resurrected being. We've got to meet this dude, Lazarus, to touch him and feel him and make sure this is real. These fools wanted to, they heard about it. They wanted to meet him. The uniqueness of the resurrection of Lazarus, apart from being the most recent resurrection Yeshua had performed, because it wasn't the first, but it was unique, was that Lazarus had been dead for four years days. According to Jewish theology, it was impossible to dismiss the miracle by claiming that he had simply just been resuscitated. And in Jewish theology and Jewish history and Jewish belief, they believed that the soul would circle the body for up to three days and that there was a chance of resuscitation where the spirit would re-enter the body and the person would come back alive. But after four days, the spirit has departed the soul. Many people desired to visit Lazarus when they received word that he was raised after being dead for four days. People are like, I got to see this, doc. I got to see this. This is in history. This is documented in history. At the time of the resurrection, many Jews reported the event to the Pharisees, but many other Jews believed in Jesus as a result of that miracle. People are like, straight up, that's God. The point is reiterated in the next phrases. But the chief priest took counsel that they might put Eleazar also to death, because that by reason of him, Lazarus, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus, on Yeshua. And that's John 10, uh, John 12, verse 10, 11. Many believed on Jesus when he first performed the miracle and many more believed when they saw Lazarus. 
So these fools are like, dog, we don't only, we not only need to kill Jesus, we need to kill Lazarus too. And they're like, yeah, 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 yeah. I didn't know that. Boom! I didn't know that. I didn't know that they also wanted to kill Lazarus too. Doesn't, doesn't surprise me none, bro. Doesn't surprise me none, bro. I'm not even going to go there. The Sanhedrin's etiological conclusions are apparent. Sorry, let me go back a little bit. Many believed on Jesus when he first performed the miracle, and many more believed when they saw Lazarus. The Sanhedrin's illogical conclusions are apparent. The chief priests not only conspired to kill Jesus, they also want to kill Lazarus because he had the audacity to allow himself to be resurrected, causing many Jewish people to believe Jesus, what, Jesus was the Messiah. Did the chief priests think they could keep Lazarus dead this time? <laughs> Dog, he already was raised from the dead, dead, dead. And they're like, damn, dude, we gotta kill him again. What, you think you're gonna keep him dead, bro? This is funny. That's funny. That right there is funny. So here's what I gotta say about all that. This is all in history. Now, I love how people want to take word for word what Aristotle, Plato, Nietzsche, all these other fools, they will take word for word what these guys said. We didn't meet them. We weren't there when they wrote that stuff down. We're taking this through a transcribed, through a passed down, through a filtered. Here, this is what Plato said. We weren't there to hear him say it. We believe history. We believe the text. We believe the people that heard it from 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 the people that, from the people that saw it. To this day, some of the greatest record keepers of all time were these Messianic Jews. The way they memorized the book of Isaiah and, and, and the, the, the things of the Bible, the Torah, the way they passed down that knowledge, the way it was memorized, the way they had to, before they could mature they had to have certain things down it was crazy so we have a lot of information that was kept perfectly in records that people were just choosing to disbelieve which is i'm not going to go ahead and say it's your right because well of course it's your right but because it can be done because you can choose to ignore Facts, you can choose to keep your head in the sand. But then it was explained to me like this. This made a lot of sense to me. Why don't people want to believe in Jesus? Simple. Pride. Ego. I really don't like people telling me what to do. And for some odd reason, people think the Bible is a list of rules, of do's and don'ts that you have to do in order to be right with God, and that couldn't be further from the truth. You see, your salvation is something that you you are given. You can't earn it. You have to choose to accept it. Now, you can earn riches in heaven because you are doing the work of God in and through you, meaning you are allowing Jesus to work through you, and you willingly selflessly give yourself to him and sometimes it involves some pretty ugly work because that's the realness that's the reality of sin that's the ugly truth of this world is it's very broken it's very real out there my wife's a school teacher and bless her and some of the stories that she comes home with and what she has to deal with on her heart let alone what she has to deal with trying to raise up these young, bright minds because it's difficult raising children. Anyone who has kids knows it's hard to, to teach children, um, gosh, let alone a, a classroom full of them. I would get trampled in a moment. They would own me within 37 seconds. So I give it, I tip my hat to teachers. and But it doesn't stop with just A, B, C, and one, two, three. There's a little girl that was just recently 
transferred to her school from, from another country and, and call it what it is. It's like an army brat type uh, family. And the poor little girl in kindergarten or first grade has autism. And she's just a bright, sweet, beautiful little thing. And my wife's just got a, a heart for her. And she ran into my wife's room and said, my daddy doesn't want to be married to my mommy anymore. They're getting divorced because the poor kid doesn't know anything about anything and her autism that's just what she does so she repeats this a couple different times and my wife just uh, in her crushed state was like could you imagine how the wife must feel man you don't even understand what some people are going through you don't understand what what hardships and what reality some people live in and it could just be something so simple, but so crushing and so heartbreaking. As a divorce with a child that doesn't understand, that keeps on repeat like a parrot, rubbing it in. And that's sad, man. It's sad when the honesty of the children comes out. And it's almost like you have to remind yourself, don't kill the messenger. Man, these kids are so brutally honest, but it's not their fault. It's not their fault that they have honest information that they're giving up and we can't accept it, that we can't understand it. That's our ego. That's the same thing that keeps us away from God. It's, it's that we can't accept the truth. It's that it's too painful to accept the truth. So we just block it out. We just keep it away. We do whatever we can to find something to put in its place. But anyone who understands anything about living is you've got a God-sized hole in your heart. You have eternity on your heart. My dog and cat are not concerned about how, what their 401k is doing or where their future uh, offspring is going to go to school and what neighborhood they're going to raise them in. That dog and cat are worried about when we're going to eat. What we eat. Man, I like that little freeze-dried chicken toppings. <laughs> so what I'm getting at is dogs, animals, they don't have eternity on their heart. We do. We have this eternity on our heart. We have this burning desire to have purpose and meaning. And if you've ever read anything, and if you've ever understood anything about real life, you have learned that giving is better than receiving. And you have learned that just about everything under the sun is vanity and the chasing of the wind because it doesn't ever satisfy you. You have an insatiable appetite for money, for education, for going fast, for being fit, it's never enough, no matter what it is. But when it comes to Jesus, which is tethered outside of everything under the sun, Jesus, God being tethered outside of the universe, of everything under the sun, that is when you have purpose and meaning. That is when you have an anchor and a foundation. People don't want to believe in Jesus because they feel they have to change. That's, that's not entirely true but it isn't entirely false. You're going to want to choose to change for Jesus because you'll understand the love that comes from him first. Jesus loved us first. It is almost impossible not to love something that loves you first. It's almost impossible. Now you can try. You can try real hard. But you're just drawn to want to know why it loves you and you... You spend enough time with anything. That's that. Time is the biggest thing. A relationship with Jesus don't happen necessarily overnight. I mean, you choose to accept Jesus. That happens the second you choose to accept him. But you develop a relationship day by day. Jesus was born a baby. And God raised him up day by day. So he didn't just blop, get like electrocuted with... A lightning bolt from God and okay, I'm Jesus. I raise people from dead. I make you better. I feed you a bunch of fish. He didn't robotically like drone out and make everything happen. He was a normal human like you and me. Crazy. Crazy. But he was 100% God. So he could do stuff that you and I will never be able to do. No one before and no one after will ever be able to form, perform the miracles Jesus performed.
You can choose to accept that or not. It's all there clear cut in history. All these fools talking about it. You can just choose to ignore it because, nah, man, I don't want to change. Blah, 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 blah. I like my life. Blah, 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 blah. That's fine. That's what a lot of people do. I like my life. I don't need Jesus. I ain't weak like you, bro. I don't need him. Dog, it has nothing to do with being weak. We're all weak. It has nothing to do with being broken. We're all broken. It has nothing to do with how peaceful your life is or how hard your life is. God ain't just a debit card, bro, that you just swipe in and poof, pick a white fences, rainbows. It's a rain while it's sunny out. It don't happen like that, B. You choose to accept Jesus and the weights fall off because you realize it ain't you. You realize it ain't you in charge. You realize it ain't your control. You realize, God, I'm not the one to control this whole kit and caboodle. Now, you don't lay your feet up. You still got action. You still got work. You still got things on your heart. But you now want to honor God with those things. You no longer want to honor yourself. You no longer give a crap about man's applause and people trying to hoist you up on their shoulders and march you around town. You just don't care. You've learned that there's never enough of it. Listen to all these rappers. Listen to all these uh, Elvis and all these musicians that have done incredibly well. Listen to Justin Bieber. They're lonely. You don't understand what it's like to be on the top with that spotlight. They can't handle it. It's never enough. Doc, there's a lot of peace in being content, knowing that I'm not in control. God is in control. It doesn't bother me who's the president. You honor the president. It doesn't bother me who the president is. That, that, that's not an issue. I don't have to turn on the news. I'm not associated with social media. YouTube is an outlet for me to potentially go out and make more disciples because I can only go outside so much. People will only listen to me so much. This video might get 15 views, but it's 15 more people than I would have been able to talk to living where I live. So this is the only social media platform I get to engage in solely for the purpose of honoring God with what he asks us to do. I believe this stuff because it makes a lot of sense and it makes a heck of a lot more sense than the science crap you guys got thrown out there. It's ridiculous what kind of garbage people will believe over believing the truth because the truth cuts. The truth has conviction. The truth comes with a price. No one wants to be a hypocrite and no one will die for a lie. Thousands upon thousands, if not billions of people have died for the sake of Jesus and the name of Jesus because they were living for the truth. They were, they were trying to expose the truth and it caught them in a situation that cost them their life, but they died for the truth. If you knew it was a lie and it came time to get your head chopped off, you're going to say, okay, 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 okay. I'm done, I'm done, I'm done, I'm done, I'm done. We're good, we're good, we're good. My bad, my bad. <clears throat> Ain't no real Christian to the billions. Nah, man, chop it off, let's go. Jesus, I'm with you, bro, I'll see you in a minute. Blah! Ain't no one gonna die for a lie. Ain't no one gonna die for a lie. You just choose to believe it or not. You choose to believe it, you gotta make some heart changes because Jesus is now gonna work on your heart. You don't get married and put on a wedding ring and continue doing all the things you did when you were single. You choose to get married because you want to become one flesh and you want to turn your back to your old ways, repent, and build something with this person you've chosen to spend the rest of your life with. It's a monogamous relationship. You are one piece, one unit. Nothing from the outside gets to come in. You wear a wedding ring to show that symbol, but just because you're married don't mean that stops. That's in your heart. You got to stop that because it's in your heart. You want to serve and love that other person. So you make changes because you realize, I love this person. Changes need to be made so I don't offset this relationship. Man, I want to please God. I want to honor God. With that comes making some changes because I am a sinner. I do things that I absorbed from the womb, yelling, cussing, getting short, 
man, there's a list of things that I do wrong daily. I'm constantly at battle with my flesh. Thank God it's not on me. Thank God Christ in me has this strength to handle whatever it is that's going to come my way. Ain't no just white picket fences with its sun shining and a little drizzle in the air, kids playing in the yard, dog. There's real life that happens. Now my life is blessed and my wife and my kids provide me heaven on earth. Oh my goodness, there's so much to be said about the little glimpses of heaven that God gives us through our spouses and our children. But make no mistake, the closest a, believing, a believer in Jesus will ever get to hell is this life. And the closest a non-believer will ever get to heaven is this life. The closest a believer will ever get to hell is this life. I can dig. So what's the purpose? Love, man. God is love. People that don't have God likely don't have love are absent from love, are absent from giving love, are absent from receiving love. God is the God of love. The more the God of love is present in your life, the more you love things, the more you take care of things, the more you love to honor all the things that were either blessed to you in your possession in this life for whatever reason, season, or a lifetime, meaning nothing's yours, you live with it loosely in the fugitives, but God trusts you with things. Nice things, things that you thought you wished for, but he blessed you with 10 times more than you asked for. Because you didn't even think to ask for some of those things. You see, God will bless you with things you didn't even know to ask for because he knows you better than you. <clears throat> but some of God's greatest gifts are unanswered prayers. So he also knows what not to give you, even though you feel in your heart and your mind and in your state, you, you deserve it or you want it. So God is, is very much in control. God is very much real. God is very much present. It's just a choice. It's a choice for you to let him in or not. He just knocks. He doesn't barge his way in. And you know what's really interesting too? And I'm going to finish with this. There's no locked gate in heaven. Heaven's not a prison. That's really interesting. When Adam and Eve sinned, it was an external force Brought on by Satan. Satan used deception as an external force, kind of like a hurricane uses an external force to blow a wind down or blow a tree down. That wind is the external force as Satan used deceit as an external force in the garden to deceive Eve into sinning. So when that happened, <clears throat> you see, God said to Adam and Eve, you can do whatever you wise want in here, but there is one door out. If you want to leave, it's right there. It's, it's, a, it's a tree of knowledge. If you eat from that, you're surely going to die. You're out. You're gone. So you guys roam around, man. Do your thing. You're not stuck here. If for some reason you feel you got this under control, you want this for yourself, you go ahead and leave. It's right there. You see, heaven was not a prison. They could leave at any point in time. And we know how that went, right? So choice, it's a choice. The choice is yours. Originality is had by the originator. It's your choice. It's yours. It's your vision. It's your dream. That's your origination. That's your idea. So I'm going to leave you with this. God loved you so much. He sent Jesus, his only son, down to walk with us, teach us, to show us what perfection looks like, to show, to show us what a sinless, selfless walk looks like. Perfect example. Because we want to idol something. All of us want to idol something. So God was like, I'm going to give you one, my son, Jesus. And Jesus had no reason to die. There was no reason for the Pharisees to kill him other than they couldn't control him. 
They couldn't control what Jesus was doing to the hearts of people, to the masses, where the Pharisees were like, dog, those are my people. The Pharisees felt entitled to those people and their minds and their hearts for their purpose, for their gain. You see, there was a struggle there. And that's Satan. That's evil. Satan feels, I'm better than God. I deserve these hearts and minds. And that's where this world is fallen. That's where everything under the sun is vanity. It's chasing of the wind. You'll never get enough of it. Only Jesus satisfies the God-sized hole in your heart. Only Jesus writes your book in heaven. Writes your name in the book of life. Writes you into the, the heavenly feast. Only Jesus. The Jews have a hard time believing in Jesus because they're so stuck on God being this pinnacle single being. They can't fathom that Jesus and the Holy Spirit are next to God. They can't fathom that. So they reject Jesus as the Messiah. That's where this whole thing comes back to. It's all just a choice. Most people don't know because people don't want you to know this stuff. That's, that, that's no different than they don't teach you the rule of 72 in, in school and they don't teach you how to be fit. Dog, there's no money in us loving each other, being healthy, and being financially independent. There's no money for them with all of us in utopia. Let that sink in. I love you guys, man. This is, this is, this is a broken world. You know, they can scrub everything on the internet regarding Donald Trump. They can scrub everything regarding Donald Trump. But y'all can't get rid of pictures of little kids. Y'all, y'all can't get rid of Google search images. <laughs> Come on, guys. Wake up. I love you. Peace.